In May of 2013, the cast of The Office gathered in Dunder Mifflin's real-life setting of Scranton, Pennsylvania to celebrate the impending finale. The festivities culminated at PNC Field, where a final participant was about to be announced. And this evening, playing, of all people, Michael Scott! Yeah. While it would end its run as one of the most iconic sitcoms of the 2000s, just nine short years earlier, the world had yet to be introduced to Michael Scott or Dunder Mifflin. All that did exist was an inconspicuous British mockumentary that would end up inspiring a cultural phenomenon. This is the story of The Office. Co-created with longtime friend Stephen Merchant, Ricky Gervais's office ran for a brief 13 episodes spread out over two seasons. While the series initially was met with mixed reviews, it quickly garnered critical acclaim amongst British viewers craving a different form of entertainment, and even helped launch the careers of co-stars Martin Freeman and Lucy Davis. The American TV landscape in the early 2000s was also in a state of stagnation, especially in regards to comedy. As Newark star ledger columnist Alan Sepinwell wrote, Friends was a great show that was the worst thing that happened to TV sitcoms, because it convinced everyone that all you needed was a bunch of really good-looking people in front of the camera. For the few shows that managed to break out of the Friends mold, they were often destined to be short-lived. No, I don't know what I expected. Both Freaks and Geeks and Arrested Development had substantial cult followings, but couldn't land significant viewership until well into or after their original runs. It was within this environment that future Office executive producer Ben Silverman sent Greg Daniels a tape of Gervais's show. Daniels, a Harvard graduate who had already made a name for himself in television as a writer on The Simpsons and as co-creator of King of the Hill, was instantly taken with the odd and often dark-humored show. Gervais and Merchant agreed to meet with Daniels and decided if an American adaptation had to be made, he was the best person for the job. Um, I thought it'd be a cool meeting to take. Uh, just to meet those guys, um, and then it turned out that they uh, were big fans of American television in general, and um, specifically of The Simpsons, and that they had really liked an episode that I had written of The Simpsons, and we kind of got along, and uh, eventually I was uh, uh, hired to adapt their work. NBC was desperately looking to fill an impending void as their top two comedies, Friends and Frasier, were about to enter their final seasons, with little or no replacement secured. The Friends spin-off Joey was an infamous failure, leaving only The Apprentice to carry the weight of the network into 2005. Meanwhile, Daniels and Silverman had experienced continuous rejections, as most studios thought The Office had no place in the American TV landscape. When it started, there was a lot of skepticism. I, including for me, I felt that um, all things being equal, there was a bigger risk in not even aspiring to do something great. The great thing about the fact of trying to remake The Office, at least you knew what you were aiming for. Right. And a lot of shows in the air were just bad, and they were imitating other shows that were bad, and imitating other shows that were bad, etc. At least we were imitating something that was, or trying to live up to something that was fresh and, and that we actually admired, as opposed to that we just thought would work on the air. Fortunately, NBC proved to be more than willing enough to give Daniels' office a shot, thanks in part to the recent success of their single camera comedy, Scrubs. The Office was given a spring 2005 premiere, leaving the creative team just a few months to cast and shoot the pilot. The pilot was to be directed by Ken Quapis, who would go on to film 12 more episodes for the series, including the finale. Quapis was the first in a long line of notable guest directors, which would later include Harold Ramis, Brian Cranston, and J.J. Abrams. Casting would prove to be no easy task, leading to the addition of one of the most influential television comedy casting directors at the time, Allison Jones. Already a veteran in the entertainment world, with such shows as Arrested Development and Curb Your Enthusiasm under her belt, Jones provided the expertise in casting a behavioral comedy. Collectively, the team decided to establish the tone of the documentary-based series through the casting process itself. The auditions were very different than any other show I'd ever auditioned for. They were more of a workshop, and you never got to see... Generally, when you get to 
a point, you know, a network audition when there, there will be a, a bunch of people from the network sort of weighing in on, on how it's going. This was very unlike that. It, it was just uh, Ken Quapis and the other actors and a camera, and he really shot the audition like a documentary. So that, that was sort of my first taste as to what it would be like. For the callbacks, they got everyone they were considering over a weekend, and they put us on the stage, and they had built the set and everything like that, and they just mixed and matched people and had them improvise, and they said, be prepared to stay all day. You may need to stay all weekend. And it was this really long process, but it was great. So I got to improvise with Steve Carell and with John Krasinski, and they kind of saw who had chemistry. Daniels knew that Gervais's outlandish David Brent character would not translate as well across the pond, and so they devised a new comedic lead in Michael Scott. People say, I am the best boss. They go, God, we've never worked in a place like this before. You're hilarious. And you get the best out of us. Um, I think that pretty much sums it up. I found it at Spencer Gifts. A middle manager with zero self-awareness, Scott served as the epitome of someone who had risen well above their station despite their ongoing incompetence. A character trope that was partially inspired by a certain political figure of the era. You know, I, um, when I speak, like right now, for example, sometimes I'll start a sentence and I don't even know where it's going. I just hope I find it along the way. The British romantic leads of Martin Freeman's Tim and Lucy Davis's Dawn were adapted into salesman Jim Nelson, later changed to Halpert, and receptionist Pam Beasley. Additional characters who ended up not making the final cut included Big Keith, an accountant from the British version who would become Brian Baumgartner's Kevin Malone, and Anton, originally intended to be played by Peter Dinklage. You know, it's one of those ideas where you're just like, Yes! <laughs> the short list of actors who were considered for the role of Jim included Adam Scott, Josh Radner, Asif Monvi, and even Paul Rudd. One young hopeful was John Krasinski, who almost blew his chance before he could even audition. And they brought in six of the seven of us and auditioned them, and I was the last one left. Some guy sat across from me and said, you know, are you nervous? And I said, well, you know, you either get these things or you don't. And I said, but what I'm really nervous for is the people who are making this show because the British show is perfect and I just really hope we don't screw it up. And he's like, I'm Greg Daniels, I'm the executive producer. <laughs> and uh, I actually threw up in my mouth a little bit. For Pam, several well-known character actresses were considered, including WandaVision's Katherine Hahn. Jenna Fisher, who had previous experience as a receptionist herself, ended up capturing the deadpan delivery that Daniels and Jones were looking for. I don't know what I'm gonna do, but whatever it is, it's gotta be a career move, not just another arbitrary job. And Jim's advice was that it's better to be at the bottom of a ladder that you want to climb than halfway up one you don't. Even before they were cast, the camaraderie between Krasinski and Fisher had begun. And they told me that I was going to be given the part of Pam Beasley on The Office. The first question I asked was, is John Krasinski going to play Jim? The role of Pam couldn't be done unless I had the right partner. And at the audition, I knew that he was my teammate. For the role of Jim's foil and Michael's assistant to the regional manager. Assistant regional manager. Assistant to the regional assistant manager. Assistant regional manager. What is it? Assistant regional manager. Oh, that's my mistake. Sorry about that. The character of Dwight Schrute evolved out of Mackenzie Cook's military-loving Gareth and into a practically Amish beet farmer with a fierce love of science fiction and justice. It's okay here, uh, but people sometimes take advantage because it's so relaxed. I'm a volunteer sheriff's deputy on the weekends, and you cannot screw around there. It's sort of one of the roles. Potential Dwights included future 30 Rock performer Judah Friedlander, Patton Oswalt, and Seth Rogen. If you're in the field, you can clean the man's wound by taking a whiz on it. That is actually in first aid books written by the Red Cross. Still, none could embody the Bears, Beats, and Battlestar Galactica-loving salesman quite like Rain Wilson. When you are in the field, you can clean a wound by whizzing on it. True, it is in the first aid guidebook from the American Red Cross Association. So it's totally unfair for me to get in trouble for whizzing in the sink. A then relatively unknown actor who had had small roles in Monk and Galaxy Quest. I am Lank, senior requisition officer. Before we travel to the ship, please let me know if you have any requirements. Weapons, documents, personnel. Um, uh, Coca-Cola, do you have one of those? 
To round out the supporting cast, the team searched in unlikely places. Phyllis Smith was Allison Jones's casting assistant at the time. Well, my story is not a typical story. <laughs> I worked with Allison Jones, and we auditioned all these people, and I read with most of the actors, and um, it was Ken Quapis. He had me to read with Rain and John, and went in there, didn't have a clue he was auditioning me. And about two weeks later, wardrobe calls and says, I understand you're playing the character of Phyllis. And I went, yes, I am. <laughs> Angela Kinsey was married to writer Warren Lieberstein, who also happened to be Greg Daniels' brother-in-law. She also had previous experience working at a call center. I thought this was such an amazing thing to be a part of. I love the BBC version. I've only done just a few commercials, and I was uh, working at 1-800-DENTIST. Yeah. I, I like that because it's not often that you get something that's both romantic and thrifty, so there's that going. Warren's brother Paul was also brought on as a writer, but would become more well-known as the depressed HR representative Toby Flenderson. Why you always gotta be so mean to me? With Lieberstein, the precedent of writers becoming actors began and would later include B.J. Novak as Ryan the Temp and Mindy Colling as Kelly Kapoor. So uh, when I went to hire the writing staff, I had hired them all on writer-performer contracts, and I was looking for people who could, uh, could do some performing, too. And, uh, and when we looked at the, the actor staff, I uh, hired a lot of improv people who could kind of make up their own material. So it was kind of, we're, we're like right in the middle in between. I think Greg's idea to get the writer to, to break down this wall as part of his concept and uh, which were you I'm, first? Which did you consider? Writer. Yourself? I've been a writer for a long time now, and this is the first acting I've ever done. And, and it I goes. <laughs> <laughs> I was surprised to be cast because I just came out here with a dream for comedy writing, and it was funny because Greg hired me off of my portrayal of Ben Affleck, <laughs> which is like pretty much 180 degrees from Kelly Kapoor, who was like the ditziest girly girl of all time. So I like that Greg saw something in me besides this like super butch girl portraying a guy who's 6'3 and kind of an idiot. Not that Ben Affleck is an idiot, the way we portrayed it is. Oh, God. As it happened, Novak and Krasinski were previously acquainted as they had both attended the same high school, with Krasinski even performing in a play that Novak had written. Finally, there was the role of Michael Scott. Both Paul Giamatti and Philip Seymour Hoffman were offered the part at one point or another, yet turned it down. The short list of other possibles included Stanley Tucci, Steve Buscemi, Christopher Guest, Eugene Levy, John Favreau, and Stephen Colbert. Eventually, it was whittled down between Better Call Saul's Bob Odenkirk. We play hard and we work hard. Sometimes we uh, probably play hard when we should be working hard, but that's probably my fault, but... Fire me. <laughs> and Daily Show correspondent Steve Carell. You know what kind of filler words? Have you ever heard of filler words? It's kind of, it's kind of like that. You know, um, que sera, sera, um, if I had to define what it meant, I'd say, um, what, what context did I use it just then? Carell, who had recently found some notoriety for his role in Bruce Almighty, won out by striking the right balance between incompetent jerk and earnest buffoon. I think he's a man who um, <laughs> clearly lacks self-awareness. <laughs> and I've always said that if he even caught a glimpse of who he really is, his head would explode. <laughs> um, and some, actually Ricky said about his character, and I think it applies to <clears throat> Michael Scott too, is that if you, if you don't know a Michael Scott, you are Michael Scott. <laughs> <laughs> With the roles cast, production on the pilot began in 2004 and became an almost shot-for-shot -shot remake of the UK's first episode. Put my stapler inside the jelly again. That's the third time he's done it. It wasn't even funny the first time. Why has he done that? You put my stuff in jello again. <laughs> That's real professional. Thanks. It's the third time, and it wasn't funny the first All two right. times I did. Right. Quickly, both cast and crew realized the best chance they had at success was by distancing themselves from the original. The biggest challenge for, for our version of the show was getting further away from the British version, and I was too probably too respectful in the beginning of the British version, and they kept saying, come on, make your own thing. And uh, it took me a while to, to figure that out. 
A soft relaunch was done through the second episode, Diversity Day, penned by Novak. Only lasting a total of six episodes, season one of The Office proved quite the challenge to sell. The pilot premiered on March 24, 2005 and brought in 11.2 million viewers, yet by the end of the season the series was down to only 4.8, leaving little hope for continuation. Both critics and audiences alike found Michael too mean-spirited and lecherous to root for. Would you like some googie googie? Oh, I have some very delicious googie googie, only 99 cents plus tax! Try my googie googie! Try my googie googie! Try my googie googie! Try my... The realistic nature of the show also left some puzzled as reality television was still finding its footing at the time, and had yet to expand outside of the genre of reality competitions such as Survivor. That's why it came as a surprise to everyone when NBC ordered six more episodes for a second season, thanks in large part to the support of NBC executive Kevin Riley. We all knew it was going to get canceled. There was a moment when the, we were shooting the last episode where the cast was sort of huddled outside and everyone was a little bit glum because it was our last week of shooting. And even though the show wouldn't even air for months, everyone kind of felt like there's no way this ever <laughs> works. And I remember Steve looking around at the cast and saying, hey, we got to make six. Like, we got six of these things. That's amazing. Like, mm -hmm. what a dream to make six episodes of this thing that's so weird and pure. The Office's true saving grace came in the form of a little film called The 40-Year-Old Virgin, which was released that summer and starred Carell as the titular character. Virgin would not only bring about a new era of R-rated comedies, but Carell's sudden launch into stardom would finally help The Office find its audience. With Carell's appeal cemented, Daniels knew it was time for Michael to have a change of personality. I've already got my name picked out. Lord Rupert Everton. I'm a, uh, a shipping merchant who raises fancy dogs. That's the life. Daniels determined the best place to begin with Carell's transformation was to focus on why his character in 40-Year-Old Virgin worked better than Michael Scott did. The guy who created the show is a first ballot Hall of Fame TV brain. Right. And he says, well, let's look at thing number two and let's think about how we should take that information and use it for the show. And the way we should is by saying that guy, that character that he's playing in that movie is so empathetic or sympathetic rather and so kind and so lovely. We need to take 20% of that energy and put it into Michael Scott. Mm -hmm. And the writers, his own writers, me included, rebelled mm -hmm. and said, D you're going to ruin it, and this is the thing that Ricky and Steven created is perfect, and how dare you, and the whole point is that it's supposed to be bleak, and Michael Scott is like David Brent, is a terrible person, and blah, blah, blah. And Greg patiently listened to all of us and heard us all out and said, no, you dummies, I'm going to do it this way, <laughs> and we're going to just add a tiny little glimmer of hope to the end of every episode. And, and he did, and that is the difference between that show lasting 12 episodes and lasting 200. Gone was the greasy used car salesman, instead opting for a clean and youthful appearance that played to Carell's natural innocence. Season 2's Take Your Daughter to Work Day introduced Michael's desire for a family and his lifelong struggles with loneliness. So, hey, what's that's your me. name? That's me. Uh, Hi, Michael. I'm Ed. So, tell me, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be married and have a hundred kids so I can have a hundred friends and no one can say no to being my friend. Another key point in Michael's development was showing his ability to be a great salesman. He was just out of depth in his current role. I'll see your situation and I'll raise you a situation. Your company is losing clients left and right. You have a stockholder meeting coming up and you're going to have to explain to them why your most profitable branch is bleeding. So they may be looking for a little change in the CFO. So I don't think I need to wait out Dunder Mifflin. I think I just have to wait out you. The true test of Michael's likability came with the season three premiere, Gay Witch Hunt. While most viewers were tuning in to see the resolution of Jim and Pam's kiss in the season two finale, they were given an entirely different romance instead. I really like this episode a lot because it spoke to the fact that Michael is not a homophobe, but he just doesn't understand the world. And they're two very, very different things. It's not, it's not that he is intrinsically racist or homophobic or sexist. He just doesn't have a frame of reference. He doesn't, he doesn't really, he's not capable of understanding. And, and once he does glean 
some understanding, he misinterprets it, <laughs> and it becomes something else altogether. But I think, at least the, the way I feel about the character, is that he has a, a decent heart, he's a decent person, and he's just trying his best. Yeah. And, and I'd like to recreate it for you. <laughs> As the world of Dunder Mifflin expanded, the early seasons also saw several additions to the main cast. Ed Helms was brought on to play Andy Bernard, a Cornell alum with serious anger management issues. <laughs> I'll say for my part, it was very daunting and I was very anxious. I was very excited because I loved the show, but, but I was very nervous because I didn't know how I would fit into the kind of vibe. I said, I, I was sort of opening up to John somehow about my anxiety and just sort of feeling uh, like nervous about it and, and he was like, come, Dude, we're all here, like, to support you, or something like... It was better than that, but yeah. Yeah, it was more... <laughs> <laughs> While Andy Buckley became Dunder Mifflin's long-suffering CFO, David Wallace. Isn't our interview tomorrow? Yes. I just happened to be in the neighborhood. Thought I'd drop in, say hello. Just happened to be in Midtown Manhattan. Thought I'd catch a show. No of a work day? No. Like Carell, Helms had cut his teeth on The Daily Show, while Buckley had left his acting career behind to become a financial advisor for Merrill Lynch, a role he continued in tandem with to the show. This meant that Buckley handled the faux crises of Dunder Mifflin at the same time as the actual 2007 recession. There was one crazy day where I was there, it was, it was during the Michael Scott paper company negotiation, and you know, I'm in there and it's, and it's me and um, Idris and you know, Steve and Jenna and, and BJ, and, you know, we're doing these scenes and then I have to duck out to call clients because like the stock market is plummeting. Like Michael, Andy, Bernard Nutt Buckley, also experienced a major shift in personality, as his post-anger management journey focused more on his familial insecurities and musical talent. The final addition to the main cast was Rashida Jones's Karen Filippelli, Jim's new love interest from Stanford. Their romance may have been predestined to fail, but Jones's success on the show would lead her to collaborate with both Daniels and Michael Schur again on their upcoming project, Parks and Recreation. The final milestone to success would be found in an unlikely form of technology. I remember when we did the Christmas episode, um, the very first one, that next week we were the number one download on iTunes, and that's when I remember everything changing, like this momentum shift hit. With iTunes now expanding the office's audience and demographics, the show soon took off, and by the fourth season had won a host of awards, beginning with Carell winning the Golden Globe for Best Actor in 2006. Thanks also to an excellent cast, crew, and writing staff, all of whom I am indebted to. If it were not for you, I would not be here right now. I don't know about that. <laughs> Through it all, the bonds between the cast continued to strengthen, with many citing that the office had become their second home with Daniels as its patriarch. I frankly, and Greg was talking about casting and assembling all of these people, I give him so much credit for, for, <laughs> <laughs> I, I do, I, I mean, I think it all starts with him and I, I think it, it speaks to the success of the show that, that five years in, we all really like each other a lot and not just cast, but crew, everybody gets along incredibly well. And that started with Greg. Greg knew to choose not only... Are you embarrassed? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, please don't. Well, Greg, I, I don't Greg knew listening. to choose people um, not only you know, based on how he thought they would be on the show, but I think also the dynamic that they would work together personally. And, and I, it, it's, uh, boy, it's such an overused and cliche kind of thing to say, but it does feel like a, a family. And we do look forward to seeing each other every day. So I think, I think that comes through as well. And I think that helps in the work. That helps with the writing because the writers and the actors are all friends as well and we, we understand each other uh, to a certain extent. When the cast won a SAG award in season three, fan favorite grassroots guitarist Creed Bratton was still considered a day player and therefore ineligible to receive an award. Nobody steals from Creed Bratton and gets away with it. The last person to do this disappeared. His name, Creed Bratton. 
The entire creative team then petitioned to SAG to make an additional one for him to ensure he was properly included with the rest. By this point, one of the show's defining characteristics, besides its comedy and characters, was its commitment to the faux documentary setup, which began by hiring a film crew who had actual experience in the reality television field. I came out of reality television, and to your earlier point about how the show got on the air, and, and knew Randall very well. He was somebody in that world we had wanted to work with, and we were trying to, Greg and I, you know, talk through with Terry or, and how we would create a look for this show, but not only that, the fact that reality television had existed kind of enabled us to create a form that was mocking it. And that's what all those talking heads are based on, all, as you call them, testimonials. That's directly from shows like Big Brother and Survivor. And Randall came out of that world, and he really helped us engineer that look. We didn't go to the database of traditional um, situation comedy people. We went to Randall, who really helped us shape that look. And he's out there you know, in shorts, looking like it's the bush. He gets confused, thinks we're at Survivor sometimes. But <laughs> Gone were the laugh tracks, studio audiences, and dolly setups of typical sitcoms, instead relying on the crew to treat the actors like real subjects. Shot composition also played a large part in the voice of the series, as the ever-present yet unseen documentary crew had to maintain the drama but not distract from the story. Throughout the first several seasons, the cast would arrive early to set and mime performing mundane office tasks for the first hour or so, allowing the crew to capture necessary b-roll footage as well as foster the environment of an actual paper supplier. The first season, we were background a lot because they still had we had the main actors and they were focusing on them. They so told us to bring paperwork to work. I mean, that never happens on a, a, on a show. So, so we literally were doing office work. Like, so literally, and basically, we're we're at our desk on YouTube or whatever, and we and we and we're being filmed, and we don't want to be filmed. That's pretty easy to do. It's like you're just regular. You're like, oh, like oh, he's very good. <laughs> like how he turned away from the camera, not wanting to be. Daniels also directed the camera crew as if they were actors themselves, insisting that they find the action. And Andy, where is he? Where the hell is Andy? Where is he, Pam? Do you know? Sometimes scenes would be shot from secret locations with minimal crew present, or intentionally miss part of the action in order to add to the layer of realism. And they cleared everyone off the set. The cameramen were hidden, we couldn't see them. Which is what they do for like big nude scenes in movies. <laughs> And, uh, and it was really wild. It was like very quiet, the lights were really dim, and you felt like something intense was happening. Another hallmark of the series was its use of the talking heads to supplement the main action. These moments provided insight on the characters' personal aspirations, subliminally conveyed through the shock composition. I'm not offended by homosexuality. In the 60s, I made love to many, many women, often outdoors, in the mud and the rain, and it's possible a man slipped in would be no way of knowing. As director of photography Matt Son explained, Jim was the only talking head at the beginning that had a view of the outside, and I think the theory was always that these were people that had more possibility of escape than some of the others. I hear Angela's party will have double fudge brownies. It will also have Angela. So double fudge, Angela. Double fudge, Angela. The writing team also drew from real-life experiences to inspire certain storylines. Michael's fateful fall into the Koi Pond was drawn from Warren Lieberstein's own Koi Pond encounter, while writer Halstead Sullivan's sister once misunderstood silent auctions in the same manner that Dwight does in the Season 8 episode, Fundraiser. While the cast would often clarify that the vast majority of the show was scripted and not improvised, some of their own suggestions would occasionally make it into a script. BJ one time asked me if there was like any sort of significant story from my childhood that um, could lead into a Pam story and I told him a story about reading a choose your own adventure book about a girl who had a tower in her house and it made me always want a house with a tower and he used that story and turned it into a story for the boys and girls episode about Pam always wishing she had a terrace. And Pam, what about you? What is your dream? Well. I always dreamed of a house with a terrace upstairs, plant flowers on it, stuff like that, since I was a girl. Even certain characters found inspiration from personal relationships. Timothy Oliphant's competing salesman Danny Cordray's moniker came from producer Randy Cordray, who even cameos as the ship's captain in Pam and Jim's wedding. 
When Ryan takes over as VP of Dunder Mifflin, he shows off a goatee that was intentionally reminiscent of Ben Silverman's at the time. Silverman would later finally be seen on camera as one of Jim's colleagues at Athlete. You know what? I think it'd be like a Kevin Durant jump shot. Perfecto. With the show's popularity continuing to rise as they entered season four, it seemed like little could deter the growing sitcom. Um, Andy and Dwight are rocking the sales team. I feel very blessed. For the first time in two decades, it looks like Hollywood writers may be putting their pencils down and picking up picket signs. Their union agreed to a walkout Thursday night in Los Angeles. In the fall of 2007, 12,000 film and television writers from the WGAE and WGAW went on strike. Fearing the impending strike, NBC attempted to preemptively salvage the season by ordering the first four episodes be an hour long, as compared to the typical 22-minute runtime, adding to the mounting pressure on the writing team. I declare bankruptcy! Once the strike hit, the cast gave little chance for debate on how the show would proceed. It was even said that Steve Carell was the first one to demonstrate his support by refusing to come into work until the strike concluded. The solidarity between the cast and crew persisted over the following months, with several joining the daily picket lines found at the studios. And we wrote 10 original webisodes. Um, the whole writing staff wrote them, but Paul and I worked on them a lot and uh, eight or nine of our series regulars acted in them, and they were all put on uh, NBC.com, and they sold ads, and they're still available on NBC.com, and they're still selling ads. And they won an Emmy. And we actually won a daytime Emmy for those webisodes. But no one was compensated for it. And it, we got... pay for the Emmy Award. We, they, 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 uh, we apparently won't even pony up for the, like, 28 bucks it cost to buy us an actual Emmy. Greg Daniels even took it upon himself, with the cast's support, to personally write a check for every crew member. And I encourage the um, company to send the lawyers in to write our episodes because their lawyers are very creative, terming a full-length airing of an episode with paid-for commercials online, a promo, is uh, really a good example of creativity and imagination. The strike ended in February of 2008, leaving the team with only enough time to complete six additional episodes for the season, and an even greater challenge writing an episode that would be strong enough to ease the tension of the past couple months, leading to one of the most celebrated episodes in Office history. How about a toast? Dell? Here's to good friends. Cheers. 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 Hmm. That is sort of an oaky afterbirth. Mm. What was that? Serving as the office's rendition of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, or rather, Who's Afraid of Jan Levis and Gould, Dinner Party had more in common with Sophocles than Seinfeld. You have no idea the physical toll the three vasectomies have on a person! Built as the explosive downfall of Jan and Michael's relationship, it was a masterclass in dialogue, character work, and humor. I actually love the, the dinner party moment when we're all sitting together and, um, you know, we've just sat down and he says something to her and, and my character says something like, yeah, I'm the devil. And I did this thing that was, I didn't plan on this, but I put my hands like I just sort of in the moment spontaneously just went like. <laughs> and it was well documented that the script was so funny that the cast struggled more on this one episode than any other, providing the necessary levity to help move past the exhausting season. Check this out. Folds. <laughs> Sorry. Dinner Party also opened up a new era of Michael's love life, ranging from the brief and bizarre... You're messing with me. About what? You did not have sex with Pam's mom. Oh, big time. What kind of car does she drive? She drives a green camera. To the charming and true. Oscar winner Amy Ryan seemed like an unlikely choice for HR replacement Holly Flax, but her offbeat compatibility with Michael quickly won over viewers. 
The continuing on and off again romances of Dwight and Angela and Kelly and Ryan also began to draw more focus. Helping balance the romantic void left behind when Jim and Pam finally said I do in season six. The boat was actually plan C, the church was plan B, and plan A was marrying her a long, long time ago. Pretty much the day I met her. And while the wedding flash mob to Chris Brown's Forever has since cemented itself in the Office Hall of Fame, the episode almost had a different ending entirely. One that featured Roy trying to disrupt the wedding while dressed as a knight on a white horse, and Dwight subsequently stealing said horse to ride over Niagara Falls, with the final shot being Jim and Pam's marriage on the boat, with the horse falling in the background. Far from being the only bizarre concept scrapped in favor of more grounded storylines, Stress Release, which was set to air immediately following the 2009 Super Bowl, was originally about Jim losing Pam in a poker game with guest stars Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. Thankfully, this was traded out for Dwight's ill-fated fire drill. To compensate for the previous truncated season, NBC ordered a whopping 28 episodes for season 5 forcing the writing team to split the season into smaller character-driven arcs, such as the Michael Scott Paper Company and adding several new characters to the now veteran cast. Future Kimmy Schmidt star Ellie Kemper was introduced as Pam's replacement receptionist, Aaron Hannon. I was a huge fan of The Office before I got a part on it. Getting to work on the show the first day was surreal because I had seen all these characters for years in my on my television, so I felt like they had been in my home. And so I knew all of them, and I think it took a minute to realize, well, they don't, a television doesn't work both ways. They don't know you. So it is surreal to feel like you know people and then to actually arrive on a set and, and meet them in person. It was, it was, it was like, I won the lottery. Season six also brought her first romantic partner in the form of Gabe Lewis, played by Silicon Valley's Zach Woods. Happy birthday to Gabe. Oh, get out, skeleton man. With Gabe came a new parent company for the bankrupted Dunder Mifflin, Sabre, and a guest appearance from Kathy Bates as the Tallahassee CEO, Joe Bennett. Tough, hearty, and having a knack for inexplicably bringing in a different pair of dogs with each appearance, Bates' Bennett proved to be a refreshing change of pace for the show. There was some bit where the, the Great Danes were obsessed with my crotch, <laughs> yeah, and, which was in the script, and then I really had to do it yes. when it happened. And, and, and the only way to do that is to actually put dog treats <laughs> in your, like, zipper, right? I didn't know that. Yeah. I thought it was just you. <laughs> Craig Robinson Sterrell was also brought up from the warehouse and joined the main cast, adding a much needed voice of reason. Whoa, that person has really gotten him or herself into quite a predicament. Little did everyone know, however, but there were much more dramatic changes on the horizon. Partway into season five, Greg Daniels and Michael Schur began working on their upcoming project, Parks and Rec. As the Foundling series began to gain steam, Daniels was forced to limit his time on the senior show. Paul Liebernstein and Jen Salata became the new acting showrunners until Jen's departure at the end of season six. The most surprising change would come towards the end of the season when Carell announced that season seven would be his last. Oh, yeah, I just thought it was time. I just thought it was, you know, yeah. seven years and, and I wanted to honor my contract. And it's, it's tough because um, it works. It works, and a lot of my best friends work on the show, and, and, you know, it's been a big, big part of my life, so. It wasn't an easy decision to make, but I just feel like now's the time, and I actually think it'll be good for the show in the long run. While it was clear that Carell first initiated the conversation, details remain hazy to the sequence of events that finalized it. Ongoing rumors of NBC choosing to let Carell go in favor of other, newer talent have only maintained the air of intrigue around the circumstances of Carell's departure. Regardless of cause, the end result was the same. Soon the office would have to carry on without its leading player. The writers set out to provide as much closure for Michael as possible. Each episode leading up to Michael's goodbye focused on certain aspects of his life, whether it was his emotional growth from Ryan or Todd Packer's toxicity, a reflection of each of his past romances leading to his eventual happy ending with Holly. Holly, relax. 
marrying me will you be? Your wife be coming. Me will I. <laughs> or even the completion of his passion project, Threat Level Midnight. Clean up on aisle five. Krell's goodbye was equally emotional both on screen and off, with many finding it impossible to film their final scenes together. And then tomorrow, I can tell you <clears throat> what a great boss you turned out to be. Best boss I ever had. That was a hard that was really that yeah. was that was tough that, that was, was brutal but it was again to everything you were saying it was that idea of family you were literally you were leaving summer camp you were leaving home you were leaving all these things all at the same time and those massive emotions of knowing that this would be the end of something that was uh you know uh, sort of a monolith in ways uh, in your life my last scene was steve even now it's emotional I was directed to run after Steve, and when I got to him, to just say goodbye. And I said goodbye. And we cried and we hugged. And it was special because there was no sound, so I could really say anything I wanted. And it was private, and it was our moment, and it, was, it will always be very special to me. With Michael given a fitting farewell, the daunting task of finding a suitable replacement for the character was proving to be more and more challenging. Like Kathy Bates, Will Ferrell was brought in for a limited story arc as Michael's replacement, D'Angelo Vickers. Despite his short-lived presence on the show, several of the character inconsistencies that began with Michael, and would more notably plague the later seasons, were already apparent, with D'Angelo's personality veering wildly from buffoon to closeted misogynist. By the end of the season, despite a myriad of cameos, audiences were left not knowing who would be Michael's true replacement. An intentional choice on the part of the writing team, as they did not know themselves. Strong cases were made for Dwight to finally get his due, or even have Daryl be promoted and let the dynamic of the show flip to have a competent boss with an incompetent staff. Eventually, it was determined that Andy would serve as Michael's immediate replacement, and a new actor would still be added to the main cast to help breathe new life into the show. This led to a battle of the Jameses, as both James Gandolfini and James Spader were strongly considered for the new role, with Spader edging out Gandolfini to become Saber's new CEO. With the changes in place, the show headed off into murky and uncharted waters. A great opportunity squandered? Absolutely. A crushing blow? Yes. Will I get over it? Mm. No. But life goes on. Not for me. Season 8 ended up being the lowest rated season for the entire series. Despite the negative reviews and lack of viewership, it would still remain one of NBC's top performing shows at the time. The reason why the show failed to resonate with audiences fell to a variety of factors. The most obvious was the general notion that the show had become adrift in Michael Scott's absence. In an effort to recreate the established dynamics, Andy's own unique charm ended up being blended into a watered down version of Michael. This would foreshadow his complete freefall in Season 9, and possibly the biggest disservice to a character in the entire series. Spader's Robert California worked well in short bursts, but proved to be too bizarre and unsettling to comfortably fit within the show in the long term. I have uh, written down a few questions. One, have you ever killed a woman? How many women have you killed? Please, sir, will you not kill me? Like post-promotion Andy, California never grew into a fully realized character existing somewhere between sexual predator and comic book villain. You don't even know my real name. I'm the lizard gang. Michael Scott's absence also heavily affected the writing process. Due to his role as a designated load-bearing character, most of the ongoing storylines could not sustain enough traction to carry a season. Dwight and Angela's relationship had since been put on the back burner for a love triangle between her husband, the senator, and fellow accountant, Oscar. Who's the senator? My boyfriend. Oh, oh, you mean the state senator? I'm sorry, I was confused because you accidentally wrote the senator. And Jim and Pam's journey into parenthood would soon be overshadowed with cheap obstacles meant to test them as a couple. Season 8 started the trend with Kathy, who attempts to make a move on Jim while in Florida, and is subsequently banished from the show. The Florida storyline also saw the romantic reconnection of Andy and Aaron, 
and the introduction of Nellie Bertram, played by Doctor Who alumni Catherine Tate. So stop looking at my breasts and start looking at my penis. While extremely well known in England, Tate was virtually unknown in the States, and her immediate role as a villain soured audiences' opinions with little hope of a future redemption. A minimal retcon was later given as to why she would behave in such a manner. My first week here, I sneezed directly into the candy jar because I thought I'd get more, I thought I'd get more screen time as a villain. But any further attempts to garner sympathy felt forced and made the character appear more pathetic than endearing. The growing size of the cast, which season 9 would do little to rectify, also began to put a strain on the show. By the end of the series, there were 18 members of the main cast, an unheard of amount for a sitcom with a 22 minute runtime. This meant that many of the cast members who had been present from the start were now relegated to mere cameos every few episodes. The creative team, on the other hand, had the opposite problem, as both BJ Novak and Mindy Kaling, who had become two of the highest seniority writers at this point, announced that they would be leaving at the end of the season to pursue the Mindy project. Paul Lieberstein also prepared to step down as showrunner in order to focus on the upcoming Dwight Centered spin-off, The Farm, once again leaving the position open. As fate would have it though, it ended up once again filled by the very man who had first held the title. With Daniels back at the helm for season 9, several changes were quickly made to help steer the series back on course. Out were California and Sabre, replaced now with CEO of Dunder Mifflin David Wallace. Jake Lacey and Clark Duke were brought on as junior salesmen to help mirror Jim and Dwight's original dynamic, a fact the show referenced at every possible opportunity. They're like the new Jim and Dwight. <laughs> oh yes, yes, I see that. No, Pete is not the new Jim. The only thing we have in common is that neither of us wants to sit on Meredith's face. <laughs> and if that makes him the new Jim, then every human being in the world is the new Jim. Their addition also served as a casting transition, as Rain Wilson, John Krasinski, and Jenna Fisher had announced that this would be their final season, forcing the show to start fresh once more. This intended reboot would never come to pass, as season 9 would soon be announced to be the final one for the series. Daniels had wanted to end the show the way he saw fit, and with NBC looking to pull the plug, a collective decision was made to wrap up on the current season. The creative team decided it was time to reconsider every idea they had been holding in for a later instance, including the largely controversial introduction of the documentary crew as actual characters. The plot was quickly abandoned though after just four episodes, but many still cited it as one of the low points of the season as it weakened the established world of the show with little to no payoff. Thankfully, the season was able to return to its roots for the final stretch of episodes and provide fans who had been following the show for the past nine years with the proper amount of closure. The series finale aired on May 16th, 2013 and was well received by critics and audiences alike. Like the rap party that came before it, it gifted longtime viewers with one last surprise in the form of an appearance of Michael Scott. I feel like all my kids grew up and then they married each other. It's every parent's dream. For audiences, it gave a chance to say goodbye to their favorite characters. For the cast though, it meant saying goodbye to the family they had come to love over the past nine years. No, I don't know how do you say goodbye. How do you say that? <laughs> I don't know if I can do that. Um, I hope that I never have to work at this location again under different circumstances. I hope that in my memory when I drive down this road, our buildings are here and our set is here. I never want to come here and walk through that stage door and see anything else because that way it will always be there. And to my castmates, it's been a joy all these years. It's just been such a great ride, wonderful nine years and the crew. Not enough words to describe how wonderful the crew is. So. I hope that all of you will, you know, keep a place in your heart for, for all of us. Bye. My heart is full of thanks. The greatest honor that I've ever had, and the, uh, the thing I'm most proud of is uh, being a part of this.
Why is this show so loved 15 years later? I think in these times we need something with, with a good heart and a, and a kindness to it. And even though it was cringeworthy comedy, it had heart and it, uh, it just touched a sweet spot. I think that truly The Office has a sweet spot for everyone or else they wouldn't keep coming back to it. I know uh, I, uh, I loved being on that show. Uh, and I, apparently everyone else loved it too, so lucky us. The Office remains one of the defining examples of illuminating the truth in comedy. While the characters of Dunder Mifflin may seem outlandish on the surface, they still have truthful roots. Everyone can say they've worked with a Kevin or no an Angela. And it's also through these layers that the characters find their relatability. Michael's offensive nature is undercut by his desperate loneliness and yearning to be loved. Oscar was never played as a stereotypical gay character even for a gag, a rarity for sitcoms of the time, with the humor rather coming from his handling of his ignorant co-workers. Dwight and Pam's understated friendship remains one of the most natural progressions in modern television. These are all people you grow to care about over the course of the series. You remain invested in their lives and want to see them succeed, regardless of their flaws. The Office also remains unique in its celebration of the relatively mundane. The life of corporate America is not a subject rife with comedic potential, but it is a universal one. If you strip away the comedy, it's just about a group of strangers brought together under their incompetent boss and just trying to manage to get through the day. Something that its successors tend to gloss over is the show's underlying sense of oppression and failure. Even with Michael Schur's later projects like Parks and Rec and The Good Place, which are admittedly more consistent than The Office is by a wide margin, there is a pervading sense of varnished optimism, that despite their character struggles, everything will end positively. The Office frequently had a character fail to achieve their goal or abandon their pursuit altogether. Pam never buys her dream home or becomes a professional artist, and Andy's attempts to become famous end in disaster. But they do find peace in what they can achieve, from a company mural to serving as a graduation's guest speaker, a role that Helms would later replicate in reality. It's about appreciating the small victories in addition to the larger ones. Because for a group of underdogs, each one matters. Landing a sale or winning back a parking space are treated as significant moments because in life, sometimes all you'll have to go off of are unexpected small victories. To paraphrase Pam's final line, it's finding the beauty in the ordinary. As The Office transitions from its long-standing home on Netflix to NBC's own platform, Peacock, a decision that has elicited quite the emotional response from fans, the series once again enters a state of flux, though there finally seems to be little concern for the future. Calls for a reunion or reboot seem to constantly pop up every couple of months, and the mini-reunion held on John Krasinski's YouTube series Some Good News currently holds over 15 million views. Regardless of reunions or platforms, the characters of Dunder Mifflin will always be around to revisit, and remind us that those small victories, unexpected friendships, and true loves are the most enduring. After all, what's an office but a family? Freeman Della Pisa!